Get in, losers. We're going 40 gig. Looking to build or upgrade your gaming PC? The new lineup of Ares Memory from Lexar is the easiest decision you'll ever make. Its sleek design will match perfectly with any build. And with Ondai error correction, your overclocks won't leave you bleeding. Ares not only delivers speed, but it rams its way through your computing memory needs without locking horns. Rhett, what is with all these puns? Ares means ram, Jeff. It's Latin. Get your RAM on with Lexar's Ares DDR4 or DDR5 memory kits by following the link down in the video description. Welcome back to Craft Computing, everyone. As always, I'm Jeff. You all know I am a sucker for some used Enterprise gear, which is why I'm particularly excited today as this is not used at all. This is a brand new brocade distribution top of rack switch that is both 10 gig and 40 gig capable. At the top of my rack for quite some time, I've been rocking a Microtech CRS317 16S Plus, which, as the name may imply, has 16 10 gigabit SFP Plus ports. But lately I've had the itch to go to 40 gig networking, mainly because of my NAS and the video editing that we do directly off of it. So upgrading to this switch right here will give me just that opportunity. So if the eBay listing is to be believed, this is a brand new brocade switch with two 40 gigabit links on the rear that just happens to be open box. And uh, so far, I'm liking what I'm seeing. So not only do we have the full set of sliding rails, we've also got our uh, rack nuts and various other accessories, including a console cable inside of that box. But there's also a couple other goodies that I noticed in here. Uh, this is a 4x10 gig QSFP passive. Uh, so this is a uh, 40 gig DAC cable, uh, but only a 4x10 DAC cable. So we'll have to see how that works out. There's also a random Chelsea SFP in here. On to the main event. Holy crap, that is heavy. Whew. That was the wrong angle to lift that switch up, let me tell you. So this, good to God, is my new network switch. This is the Brocade ICX 6610-48, and it has a kind of unique mix of network ports on it. First and foremost, there are the 48 RJ45 gigabit ports on the front, as well as eight SFP plus 10 gigabit capable ports over on the left-hand side. Around the back, though, is where things get interesting. There's a couple of management ports, as well as four 40 gigabit capable QSFP Plus ports. And this is the whole reason that I bought this switch. Of course, there are the other enterprise networking accoutrements, such as the uh, dual power supplies, hot swappable fan ports, and whatnot. But that's not really the interesting part of this. The interesting part of this is how fast this is possibly going to hook up to my NAS. But before we get to that, I'm kind of curious what makes this thing so heavy, so I kind of want to take the top cover off. The main thing I'm curious of, how much of this weight is the outer casing, and how much of this is going to be just chunks of copper for a heat sink? Because this weighs more than just your standard network switch might. Any better, I've just been used to the Microtex for so long. I haven't deployed an HP 5900 in years. Yeah, actually, that power supply is not that heavy. But you can see one of the benefits of a switch like this is you have hot swappable power supplies. There's also hot swappable fan units inside of here. Now, a really important thing to keep in mind with an enterprise top of rack switch is the direction of the airflow. Whereas most servers that you buy, they will be front to rear. They will suck cold air in the front and blow hot air out the back. Uh, this is actually a rear to front arrangement in this switch. It's meant to go on the back side of a network rack or a data center rack and have all the ethernet cables run straight up to the rear. Uh, so you can see there's actually airflow directions on both the fans and on the power supplies, indicating that the motherboard is actually the thing that receives cold air from the rear. 
All right, and uh, yeah, most of the weight is definitely still in the chassis here. You can see these very large aluminum heat sinks on here for the main board, as well as the uh, SFP Plus ports up there. Uh, the 40 gig ports are contained on a daughter assembly near the rear, as well as the couple of management ports that we have around the back. There's also a socketable memory expansion right here. Uh, looks like a DDR3 or DDR4 memory module. Uh, so I'm wondering if in the future that might be a user expandable item, if the firmware would allow that. Although I don't foresee myself needing to upgrade the memory. Uh, DDR2, 5300. Yeah, 512 megs. Okay, so just DDR2. Nothing too terrible there. But I don't think I'll ever have to upgrade that given I only have like 30 clients on my network plus my server rack. So my switching demands aren't all that high. All right, let's go ahead and get this thing all back together and buttoned up and we'll go install it into my server rack. Here we are out at my server rack and I figured we'd take a very quick look at what I am replacing. So we've got the UDM Pro from Unify up here that serves as my firewall and ubiquity controller. And then down right below it is my Microtech CRS317. Now this is a 16 port, 10 gigabit SFP plus switch. But as you can see, I don't use most of the ports on here. Now, some of these are gonna be converted over to 40 gig with the help of the new brocade. And some of these are gonna be plugged into the 10 gigabit over on the left side of the brocade. Overall, this operation should be fairly plug and play as my network is not all that complex as far as VLANs or segmentation goes. Underneath that, I have a couple of other switches, starting with the Unify 24 port PoE switch. Now, I don't currently use that switch, not for any particular technical reason. It's just my network hasn't grown to the point where I need another 24 port switch yet. And underneath that is my client distribution switch and the switch that kind of started my whole rack out and that is the Microtech CRS328. It's a 24 port PoE plus switch with gigabit, as well as having four SFP plus ports that are 10 gigabit capable. Now I used this before I expanded all of my servers to 10 gigabit and it still hosts all of my client and PoE plus connections. Now in theory, had I sprung for the Brocade 6610 with PoE plus support, I could have replaced every single switch in my rack. But seeing as how I already have two network switches with PoE Plus that I'm not even fully utilizing, it seemed like a waste of money at this time. So with all that out of the way, let's go ahead and pull this Microtech CRS317 out and get the brocade installed. All right, so that was a complete pain in the butt and pain in some other areas as well. I actually think I might've torn a muscle or pulled something getting that thing in, because uh, number one, it's extremely heavy if I wasn't already clear about that earlier in the video. Number two, I had to clear it by the exhaust pipe for my air conditioner inside of my server rack. So getting that angle in the rear of the rack with not a lot of room to work with, uh, Lots of odd angles and uh, potentially an injury, but it's now installed. Time to cable the thing up and see if we get 40 gig connections. Don't you just love it when you buy parts that are brand new from really reputable vendors and you order specific size PCI Express cards and you get low profile? Uh, so this is a dual QSFP Plus card. It's a dual 40 gig card. And I was planning on installing one into Craftinator and one into my backup server. The backup server is a low profile, which this works well. Uh, Craftinator is a full size slot. So I bought one of each card. What I received was two low profile cards. Awesome. So I guess for the test today, do as I say, not as I do. I'm going to take the half height bracket off of this card, put it into Craftinator and just kind of let it float. And then I'm also going to put a regular card into the uh, backup server. Hopefully we'll be able to get a connection today. 
We'll see. For those that are new to enterprise networking, uh, a lot of enterprise switches, you can't just plug in and have them work. So here is what's happening right now. Here we have my 2020 MacBook Pro M1 connected to a USB-C to both USB and Ethernet adapter. That USB adapter is going to a USB to RS-232 serial. We've got a 2S2 or 232 serial to RJ45 console cable going up to the rear of the brocade. And by the way, we're also negotiating at 9,600 baud. Uh, that is nine bits per second. So uh, this is how configuration is done on a switch like this. So things are not going well. In fact, they're going so not well, I think I'm going to have to revert to my old switch. Let's walk through a couple things that I found out so far, starting with my DAC cables, all of my digital or sorry, direct attached copper cables, uh, they are not supported on the brocade. Now this is actually a common problem in enterprise. Oftentimes you have to get DAC cables that are made specifically for a vendor. So if you want to use a DAC cable, you need to get one that's programmed for brocade or Cisco or Aruba or Meraki or HP. All of mine are programmed for Cisco because that seems to be the most compatible with Microtech and Unify, which has been my existing switch layout. However, they are not compatible with the brocade. Now, I can work around some issues with that. I do have some SFP Plus modules for fiber connections, and they are recognized by the brocade. However, I can't seem to get a link established on any of my devices to that brocade. And I think I just found out why. All right, I'm going to try to keep this as brief as humanly possible. So uh, if we go to our show interface brief, that will give me a list of all of our current interfaces and their current status. If I look at interface one, I'm connected over Ethernet and the link is currently up negotiating at one gigabit speeds. If I go down to the bottom of the list, we've got our one slash two, which is our 40 gig connections, and then our one slash three, which is our 10 gig SFP plus ports on the front of this switch. Well, I'm going to do a show media, and that will show me the types of media for each of these. And as we can see, I do have in port one slash three slash eight, that is port eight of our SFP plus, a 10 gig SFP plus ethernet connection, which is my fiber connection. But that port is currently down, despite being plugged into my switch right up here. Well, why is that? Well, let's go into the interface configuration. So interface ethernet 138. And I'm going to do speed. So speed duplex, then we're going to set this to 10 gig full. No license present for port 138. So I think the whole issue with my 10 gig and even my 40 gig not communicating, again, because you can see that my 40 gig passive copper is actually connected and detected, is I am only licensed on this brocade for one gigabit connections, not 10 or 40 gigabit connections. So even though I own the hardware, I have to go to brocade and buy a license to use my goddamn hardware. So when everyone asks in the comments why I drink, I'm just gonna refer them to this video from now on. Even though I am well-practiced, well-experienced as a systems administrator, network administrator, network and infrastructure manager, I still got bit by looking at hardware specs and not expecting there to be any management or licenses associated with that hardware. If you couldn't tell, I'm Definitely ticked. I'm ticked off at Brocade for the licensing situation. I'm also kind of ticked off at myself because I knew better. But let this be a lesson to all of you home labbers, small business owners, etc. about buying hardware off of eBay and not doing your research on it first. I saw these specs and I thought, 
40 gig, that will be fantastic for a couple of my use cases, specifically with my server and my backup NAS server to increase speed and uh, get things done a little quicker. However, without the licensing, which is upwards of about $3,200 to enable 10 gig and 40 gig on the brocade through CDW, well, it makes it really not worth it. So take this as a cautionary tale in why doing research is very important and save yourself not only a couple hours of frustration and beating your head against the wall, but in my case, also probably close to $300 for the Switch and the two 40 gig interfaces that I bought. Don't worry, I am not done trying to figure out how to get 40 gig networking into my Switch at an affordable cost, but obviously that's not the scenario we wound up with today. Anyway, if you like this video, make sure to hit that thumbs up button and subscribe to Craft Computing if you haven't done so already. Follow me on Twitter at Craft Computing for daily shenanigans and frustrations like this. And if you like the content you see on this channel and want to help support me in buying hardware that winds up not working, think about joining the Patreon. Link is down in the video description. That's going to do it for me in this one. Thank you all so much for watching. And as always, I will see you in the next video. And I'm going to go pour myself another beer. Beer for today is from Block 15 Brewing Company out of Corvallis, Oregon. This is the Sticky Hands, but this is a special variety of the Sticky Hands called the Brewer's Cut 2022 edition. It has a mix of Amarillo, Cashmere, Chinook, Citra, Mosaic, and Simcoe hops, clocking in at 8.1%. Now, if you're not familiar with Block 15 and Sticky Hands, this is what I would call the quintessential dank West Coast IPA. That is the hop and hemp based IPA, although it has nothing to do with hemp. It's just that's what the flavor and the, the aroma will remind you of if you have any uh, 420 friendly friends. Uh, but this is the Brewer's Cut. This is a completely different formulation, but going through the same process. So it's got a mix of, like I said, those six different hops and is definitely its own animal entirely. So here we go. Oh, wow. So where Sticky Hands usually is super, super thick, like cut it with a knife thick. This actually has a little bit of a, a little bit more of a playful body to it. And whereas this dives straight into that bong water style uh, uh, flavor profile, again, this is just a little bit lighter, a little bit more playful. There's like some lemon and citrus notes and a little bit of like flowery hibiscus kind of stuff on top of it. This, I'm a fan. <laughs> What uh, Sticky Hands is, is still definitely there. It is definitely a deep, dark, rich hop flavor down below. But I really like what they've done with this to just brighten it up just a little bit. That lemon note right on top, it's very subtle. But honestly, I think it, it makes this from a really good beer in Sticky Hands to a phenomenal beer with the Brewer's Cut. My opinion, you should switch to this recipe full time.